Welcome to this next class of our study of the book of Revelation. We will be covering Revelation chapter 9 verses 1 through 12. Now to be perfectly honest, I had some problem with my recorder at the class when we were doing it with people all around me. So this particular recording is just me sitting at my desk and you will not have the benefit of the comments of, that other people make. I will again be, uh, we will start today by reading the verses that we will be covering. In the, and the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen out of the sky to the, south, to the earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. And he opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and smoke went up from the shaft like the smoke from a large furnace and it darkened to the sun and the air. And out of the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of earthly scorpions. And they were told not to harm the grass on the earth or any green plant or tree. They could harm only the people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. But they were not allowed to kill them, only to torture them for five months. And their torture was like the torture of a scorpion whenever it stings a person. And in those days, people will look for death and never find it. And they will long to die, but death will escape them. And the locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. And on their heads there seemed to be crowns that looked like gold. And their faces were like human faces. And, their, and they had hair like women's hair and teeth like lion's teeth, and they had breastplates like iron, and the noise of their wings was like the roar of chariots, with many horses rushing into battle, and they had tails like a scorpion and stingers, and in their tails they had the power to hurt people for five months. The king who was over them was the angel of the bottomless pit. In Hebrew he is called Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. The first woe is past. Take note that after these things there are two more woes yet to come. You will notice that I handed out quite a few handouts for this particular section of the book of Revelation, and those are the things that are going to be flashing across the screen as we do our lesson. Now the first thing that we turn our attention to is this star. And, of course, it immediately jumps out that it is not just any old star or regular star, but it seems to be personified because the star is referred to as he. And we'll see other examples of this star and who it is as we go along. But just, just to cut to the quick, it's Satan, okay? Uh, the star that had fallen out of the sky is put in the past tense. John doesn't say he actually saw the star fall. To this star was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Again, this is in past tense. John doesn't actually say he saw the star receiving the key. We have two important shifts from uh, the first four trumpets in this particular vision. First, with the first four trumpets, the plagues were brought about directly by God. With this trumpet, the plague is released by this star. We'll see that in verse 2. While God permits or allows this plague to happen, God is not the direct cause of it. This is an important distinction. We shall see that what is released on the earth is all the false doctrine, lies, religious delusions, and so forth, which have sprung up from the pit. While God permits sin to exist in this world, he never approves of it, nor is he the direct cause of it. And there are just a ton of Bible passages that refer to that. Uh, I'll read off a couple. Uh, Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Or Deuteronomy 32.4, The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just. 
a God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright as he. 1 Samuel 15.29 Also the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. And we could keep going on. Psalm 25.10 Psalm 89.35 Psalm 145.17 Romans 1.17 Titus 1.2 Hebrews 6, 12, I mean 17 through 18, James 1, 17 are more examples of the same thing. God is not in the practice of deceiving people. Uh, it just isn't in his nature. The second thing that we should note is the use of the past tense. We already talked about that passingly. Uh, many commentaries actually take no notice of this. However, if you hold to the view that this star is Satan, which, as I said, I do, then the past tense can be, be a reference to the fall of Satan. However, the identification of the star as Satan does not rest or fall on the past tense, as you will see. The past tense just strengthens this thing. The possible symbolic significance of stars has been discussed in the notes on Revelation 1.20, and again in the notes on Revelation 8, 10, and 11. The different interpretations of the star are amazing, but we're not going to go into that by the commentators. Uh, and a lot of people identify it with various people throughout the history of the church and the world. And so it could be uh, a little bit dangerous to offer uh, an interpretation, but that's the way it goes, uh, because I think it's uh, Satan and so that's uh, where I'm going. Uh, and a number of uh, bright people uh, think that. And when you, so the star has fallen, it's Satan, uh, past tense, and he's been given this key. So let's look at the key now. Uh, keys are used uh, primarily in the Bible, like you would think of a key, uh, I mean, not primarily, but it's used like a key to open a door or something like that. Uh, let's see here. Becker uh, intimates that the key represents the limited power which Satan has to work his misery on the earth. We consider passages like Job 1.12 and Job 2.6 and Matthew 13.19. And we could go on. Uh, Matthew 13.25 and 26, verse 38. Luke 13, 6, uh, skip ahead, First uh, Peter 5, 8, Jude 6, and so forth. Jude 6 is sometimes uh, used to uh, interpret it to mean that Satan has no influence in the world, and that's a misreading of the text. While the fall of Satan and his chaining recorded in Jude 6 occurred before the fall of humanity into sin, we certainly see Satan active. Genesis 3 depicts Satan clearly active in bringing sin into the world via the snake. Uh, and we can make that identification uh, because of Revelation 12, 9. The chaining of Satan is like the chaining of a watchdog. The watchdog is limited to what it can do, but it is not powerless. Ask any fool who steps inside the range of the chained dog to find that out. The word key, uh, as I said, doesn't appear all that often in the King James Bible anyways, only eight times. Uh, those references are Judges 3.25, Isaiah 22.22, 22, Matthew 16.19, Luke 11.52, Revelation 1.18, Revelation 3.7, Revelation 20, verse 1, and of course our current passage. It is used in reference to regular keys. It is more commonly used to indicate authority or power over the access to something. For example, in Luke 11, uh, Jesus uses the word key to indicate that the experts in the law have restricted uh, access to knowledge. Key is used in this most common way in our text. Satan uses this limited power to unleash his plagues upon humanity. We ought to understand that the key uh, to the pit. This is uh, from Tychonus. Uh, key uh, to the pit to be false teachings that can 
find those within it in such a way that they are not able to look upon the light of the truth. This is what false doctrine does. The bottomless pit. It's difficult to imagine how any understanding of the bottomless pit or abyss uh, could be offered other than hell, yet there are any number of them. And I'm not really going to go into them because it's a waste of time. Uh, the bottomless pit gives us another image of hell. In this picture of hell, a person would be eternally falling. There is no place to alight, only a continual falling. The pit is full of thick smoke, that would be in verse 2, which makes seeing where you are falling impossible. You are left utterly disoriented. Many people say where there's smoke, there's fire. And, of course, we have that reference to furnace, so perhaps there's flame there as well. Uh, but at any rate, it is a completely disoriented situation. There are many images for hell in the Bible. This happens to be a, a pretty frightening one. Uh, the pictures of fire are used often, and they certainly frighten people. Uh, the worst description of hell is probably the one that sounds the least frightening, and that is to be simply cut off from God. But if we remember that God is the source of everything that is good, and then you start running down a checklist of all the good things that God provides, sunshine, health, family, laughter, joy, all these things are good, and they are absent in hell. Friends, no friends. Friends is a gift from God. On and on and on. And all of a sudden you begin to realize that the real horror of hell is the utter separation from God. Now we have a trumpet. And the angel is blowing its trumpet. And the trumpet carries the same meaning as it did with the first four angels blowing their trumpets. And you can refer to the notes that you took on Revelation chapter 7 verse 2. We do always need to remember that the book of Revelation is a book filled with symbols and images. We are not to press those images beyond their intended purpose. Jesus is not intending us to understand in this verse that we can find somewhere on this globe a shaft which leads to a bottomless pit or that it has a lid which any competent locksmith could pick. Hell is more a more terrible existence than any human can imagine. The terror of eternally falling through flames, if you want to accept that furnace as indicating flames, with nothing to grab onto is only one image of hell in the Bible. All images of hell are intended to make any reasonable person want to avoid that place. Verse 2, And he opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and smoke went up from the shaft like the smoke from a large furnace, and it darkened the sun and the air. Uh, we just already talked about that. The only other thing I want to, well, a couple of things really, is that we have parallels again to the plagues of, in Egypt. The ninth plague uh, was darkness, and here we see the darkness. Again, it's much greater than the plagues uh, in Exodus because that only happened for Egypt. Egypt, whereas this covers the whole uh, world. Uh, the other thing that we will see as a parallel when we get to it are the grasshoppers, and the Egyptians had uh, their plague of grasshoppers. Only once again, this would be a much greater plague than the one for Egypt. Uh, the first phrase is easy. Satan opens hell. This should not be pushed to mean more than Scripture tells us in clear passages. Satan has no authority to remove the eternal punishment which God has decreed against him or the other demons. Satan also does not have the power to overturn the judgment of God against him or other demons. The key is given uh, to him in verse 1, indicating that the authority of Satan now exercised is only that which is given to him. In verse 1, it was clearly demonstrated from Scripture that the authority of Satan is limited. This opening of hell is not to set at liberty Satan, 
or the other demons from damnation. What is unleashed, as we shall see, is all the lies and deceits which make up all the false religions and false doctrines found throughout history. The smoke belching, belching forth from hell fits well the biblical concept of hell as a place of eternal torment. The idea of hell as a place of fire we already mentioned, uh, but some of the common passages uh, would be places like Isaiah 30, verse 33, uh, Isaiah 33, verse 14, Matthew 3, 12, Matthew 13, 30, and so forth and so on. Uh, this smoke from hell darkens the uh, sun and the air. Uh, it's interesting that nothing that doesn't talk about people coughing or sore eyes or anything like that, only the darkening pale which hangs over the world. It's ominous foreboding of what's to come. God's truth still shines, but men no longer see it. Their minds are blinded. There is a veil on their heart. You can look at Romans 1. Uh, 21 Ephesians 4 18 Hebrews 6 4 through 6 and so forth it is a fearful thing for man not to be able to see what he needs to see most of all the son of righteousness and we think of passages like Malachi 4 2 and Joel 2 verse 2 and verse 10 a fair question to ask at this point is why should the Son in this plague make us think of God, His Word, His truth, and so forth, when it didn't in 8.12? There we thought of uh, natural, the natural Son. There are several answers. The context of the fourth trumpet makes make us think of the natural Son. It was related to the moon and the stars. It was in the first grouping of four trumpets. The number four regularly relates to the created order. It came before the eagle, which announced that the next plagues would be much worse. Our current sun, in, in the verse we're looking at now, comes after the eagle, and so we expect a greater plague than the one which came with the fourth trumpet. As we read the rest of the verses associated with the fifth trumpet, we encounter creatures from hell, which are intent on the spiritual destruction of humanity. Simply darkening a physical sun would send no one to hell. Also, the use of the word light to depict God and his word is a common uh, use of the word light in scripture. Psalm 27, 1, Psalm 43, 3, Psalm 119, verse 105 and 130, Micah 7, 8, Luke 1, uh, 79, John 8, 12, 1 Peter 2, 9, 1 John 1, 5, and on and on. In fact, even the word sun is used, S-U-N, is used to name God in Psalm 84.11 and Malachi 4.2. So the use of the word sun to represent God and his truth is in harmony with how scripture speaks. To use it in such a way in our current passage fits the context far better than to think of the natural sun. Uh, so... Um, We have the darkening of the word of God, the word of truth, uh, by this cloud of false teachings. Verse 3 and 4. And out of the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of earthly scorpions. And they were told not to harm the grass on the earth or the green plant or tree. They could harm only the people who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. First, we look at locusts, and of course, I already mentioned that uh, there was a parallel to the eighth plague uh, for the Egyptians in Exodus 10 here. Uh, and if you look at that passage in Exodus chapter 10, you can get a sense of this plague uh, from just a few verses from that account. I'll read 13 through 15. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord directed an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled in all the territory of Egypt. They were very numerous. There had never been so many locusts, nor would there be so many again. 
for they covered the surface of the whole land, so that the land was darkened, and they ate every plant of the land and all the fruit of the trees that hail that the hail had left. Thus nothing green was left on tree or plant of the field through all the land of Egypt. Now to be perfectly honest, there has been a lot of silly things written about these locusts. Probably one of the silliest ones I've heard uh, in my lifetime is that they are Apache attack helicopters. There's nothing about these things that are attack helicopters. And one of the pictures that is going to go by with a handout on these locusts will show an artist uh, rendition of what these things look like just based on what the text says. And if you look at that, you're not going to see a helicopter. You're going to see a, a, a demonic creature. Uh, they're, they're also, well, I couldn't even begin to talk about all of the wild ideas that people have had over the centuries. Uh, one of the reasons that you get these sorts of wild ideas, I, I guess, is that people don't know too much about locusts, at least where it's not in America, not today. Uh, so w on this locust insect your, uh, handout, you're going to find probably more than you ever wanted to know about locusts. Basically, they are part of the grasshopper family. They eat everything that they land on, uh, every green blade of grass, every uh, leaf on a tree. They are incredibly destructive. Uh, and you'll find some uh, descriptions of them. Any good Bible encyclopedia or dictionary is going to give you good articles on them. And I've included some excerpts in that handout that, if it hasn't gone by already, will be soon. Um, they come out of desert places. They like dry areas. They don't live very long, maybe five months, something like that. The word locust is found, or plural or singular, found 28 times in the King James Bible. And the gr word grasshopper, or the plural, 10 times. Seven of the references are in Exodus 10, and they refer to the plague upon Egypt. Two more, Psalm 78, 46, and Psalm 105, verse 34, also refer to the Egyptian plague. These references indicate that the locusts are, uh, three references indicate that locusts are acceptable food for Jewish diet. Those are found in Leviticus 11. And two indicate that John the Baptist ate locusts. That's Mark Matthew uh, 3, 4, and Mark 1, 6. Locusts are also used in the Bible as a point of comparison. Israelite spies felt that they were as small as grasshoppers compared to the inhabitants of Canaan. That's in Numbers 13. God uses a similar comparison in Isaiah 40, 22 to indicate that he is all-powerful. The psalmist also, in Psalm 109, verse 23, uses a comparison to locusts to indicate his weakness. A comparison in Job 39.20 is, is intended to indicate that God is all-knowing. A comparison to Ecclesiastes in Ecclesiastes 12.5, based on the short lifespan of the locust, encourages us to remember God when we face death. Proverbs 30.27 tells us, that we can learn cooperation from the locusts. I'm not sure how helpful any of those things are. The remaining references could be grouped under the heading of destruction and or judgment, under which, of course, the nine references to the Egyptian plague could also be placed. There are two references in Revelation 9, which we're looking at, of course. Uh, in 1 Kings 8, 37 and 2 Chronicles 6:28 Solomon asks in his prayer dedicating the new temple if the people are punished by a locust plague God would hear their prayers from the temple and relent in 2 Chronicles 7:13 God responds to Solomon's prayer by saying he would hear and respond to the prayer of repentant Israel Again, now moving on, Judges 6.5 and Judges 7.12 indicate that the Midian's army 
was as numerous as a plague of locusts, so, you know, a lot. The Midian raids were allowed by God because Israel had fallen into sin. Jeremiah also predicted that armies as numerous as a plague of locusts would punish Egypt. That's in chapter 49, verse 23. Isaiah tells us how God judges Assyria with armies which destroy things like a plague of grasshopper. Isaiah 33, 4. And we could go on with these sorts of references. To all of these passages, we now add... Uh, the short book of Joel. Chapter 1 depicts the horrible results of a plague of locusts which set, swept through Judah as a judgment from God. Chapter 2 starts out by using this locust plague as a background for the coming day of the Lord. Chapter 2 closes out with some wonderful gospel and chapter 3 is full of gospel. In many ways, the book of Joel is the primary Old Testament background for Revelation 9, 1 through 12. However, the Revelation 9 swarm is worse than the Joel plague. Clearly, the most common biblical association for locusts is judgment. When used in this way, the accent is on their destructiveness or voracious appetites and their huge numbers. We can now return to our current text. Out of the smoke from hell comes a swarm of locusts. The Bible doesn't tell us specifically that the locusts came from hell, but that is a moot point. Clearly they came from hell, the smoke simply obscuring their ascent. The text does not imply that the smoke changed into locusts like some people think. Immediately we find out that these are not normal locusts. These hell-spawned creatures were given power like the power of earthly scorpions. Verse 10 tells us point blank that they had tails like scorpions. We are also told in verse 4 that these locusts have no interest in the normal food of locusts. Instead, they are intent on harming people. So without going any further, we know that this is not a plague of normal locusts. The rest of this vision simply confirms this view, and thereby also confirms the view that the word sun in verse 2 should be unsym understood symbolically. And when we get down to verses 5 and 6, we'll get more information about scorpions. While these hellish creatures desire to harm humanity, their power is limited. In verse 4, we are told they cannot harm those who have the seal of God on their forehead. This is a clear reference to Revelation 7, 2, and 3. You can refer to those notes if you don't remember how this stands for those who have come to faith in the Lord Jesus through the means of grace most specifically baptism. We will also find uh, another limitation in verse 5. In identifying what these locusts represent, we need to be consistent with the image our Lord has shown us. Therefore, we are looking for something that springs from hell, something that is numerous, something that is aimed at humans, something that is incredibly destructive, something that obscures the truth of the gospel, and something that cannot hurt true Christians, those who cling to the word of God. There seems to be only one thing that fills the bill, and that is false religions, false doctrines, false teachings. This includes all false doctrines that have plagued visible Christendom, as well as all false religious and religions and philosophies in general. The vast number indicates how manifold these things are, as it has once been said, truth is singular. Lie, diver uh, deception, so forth and so on, is multifaceted. There is a million and billion wrong answers. There is only one right answer. These ghastly distortions of nature serve as a shocking reminder to the readers of Revelation in two ways. Many people may well be dazzled by the deep things of Satan, but in reality, they are the ugliest things in this world. Secondly, just as a plague of locusts is next to impossible to control, so the plague of false religious teaching is humanly impossible to stop. The smoke hid the origin of these lies. Now that they are at large, man cannot control them. Only in God and his pure word is their hope. I've already mentioned uh, the people who have the seal of God on their forehead, so we're just going to push on. Now we're at verses 5 and 6. 
but they were not allowed to kill them, only to torture them for five months, and their torture was like the torture of a scorpion whether it, whenever it stings a person. And in those days people will look for death and never find it. They will long to die, but death will escape them. Five months. Uh, many commentators just skip right over that, but John repeats it twice. Our Lord repeats it twice. So it seems like there we should make something out of that. Uh, so here goes. Five months. Five refers to often the five senses. Uh, so we get the range of emotions and, and all that kind of stuff, which goes with our five senses. One might say that the uh, false religions, false prom. Uh, doctrines promise things uh, they appeal to our five senses to our emotions and so forth of course they don't deliver but that is the level they're coming at uh, can't you feel the spirit moving sort of a thing the other uh, way to look at five months is to think of it as half of ten and uh, ten being complete um, so uh, the five months then would represent uh, incompleteness uh, sort of a thing. Uh, anyways, I kind of like the idea. Oh, Sweet uh, thinks that it's just an increase over one quarter and one third, which we saw earlier in Revelation 6 and Revelation 8. Um, so uh, uh, that's that. Uh, uh, we do notice also a five-part structure here, and it's accented in our uh, God's Word to the Nation translation. It's from the Chi structure, uh, and their torture will, was like the torture of a scorpion whenever it stings a person, and in those days people will look for death and never find it, and they will long to die, but death will escape them. The uh, emphasis there that I was giving indicated where the word Kai comes in. Some translations omit the word Kai, but if you leave it, then you can see that five-part structure and the misery that these things bring. Uh, notice again sort of the uh, five sense, the sensation sort of aspect of these things. And this might be why we have to repeat like dying twice so that we can get to it. So the summer, uh, number five may be being used to accent the suffering which false religious beliefs bring. Throughout time, false religions and doctrines have brought not only spiritual harm into this world, but also emotional and physical harm. The Bible records people sacrificing their children in misguided false religious practices. Christian scientists and Jehovah Witnesses both often refuse med medical treatment and forbid their children to receive such treatment due to false religious beliefs. Window, uh, widows in India are expected to burn themselves alive when their husbands die due to their false religious beliefs in, the, in Hinduism. Radical Muslims are today bringing much physical suffering into our world. And this, of course, is not a new practice for adherents of this religion. So uh, there's that. And uh, the duration factor, uh, here, here I'm, I'm going to, Cassioni uh, says, uh, most of the five-part set speaks about suffering, endurance, and crying. The duration of suffering is an important factor. Ten is the number of completion, half of ten, that suffering is not yet complete and will continue for a while. You can look at Revelation 17.10. The saints in the fifth seal are comforted in heaven and told to wait a little while longer until the rest of the martyrs join them. That would be Revelation 6.11. The suffering that symbolically continues for five months is a numerical representation that this uh, arithmologic form. Revelation may speak about suffering in five uh, phrases or use the number five to express the same concept. At times these two consecutive sets of five suggest, in other words, uh, it's suggesting that while this is bad, this ain't the end. It's not complete. Uh, so uh, that kind of takes care of the number five. Now we're going to move on to uh, not allowed to kill them. 
with the reasoning for the time frame of five months now determined, uh, that is, uh, it's appealing to the senses, uh, it's going to bring a lot of suffering, but it's not the end. Um, we turn our attention to the new limitation which these grotesque grasshoppers have. We are told they were not allowed to kill them. Those who twist the book of Revelation to make it depict future battles between na nations generally omit uh, commenting on this phrase. Obviously, people die in war. How can this fit? Uh, you know, Apache, uh, attack Apache helicopters kill people. So how is it that they're not able to kill anybody? Uh, there are two simple reasons for this limitation on these dealers of deception. First is that the human soul is immortal. By this statement, all I mean is that human souls continue to exist forever, either in hell or heaven. And lots of passages about that. Daniel 2, 12, 2, Matthew 25, 46, Matthew 12, 26, and 27, so forth. Second is that death, whether we think of physical death or eternal death, that is damnation, is in the hands of God. This power is never given to Satan. As we consider the torment which these locusts bring, a torment which uh, makes the unbelieving people of the world desire death over the torment, uh, many people uh, have made some interesting points. This is by Cassioni. The image of the heathen's torment are symbolic of their spiritual de deprivation. It would be a mistake to view these plagues as physical events. This would mean God is going to unleash wild and fantastic creatures on the earth at some future date, such as fire-breathing locusts. It would also mean that Revelation is not an important book in the Bible, except to prepare some future generation for these events. Why in the world would they keep a book if it didn't have meaning for them? Uh, and so forth and so on. Now we go on to the word scorpion, all which is all that is left in these two verses that we need to come up with some sort of understanding about. Scorpions are venomous insects which live in hot climates, which I'm sure you know. Uh, they are one to five inches long. They have their stinger in their tail, which uh, injects the poison into whatever they're stinging. This thing is usually strong enough to kill their target, their carnivorous. Uh, the sting is uh, really almost never uh, deadly to people unless you've got some sort of really bad allergic response to it, in which case don't get stung by a scorpion, obviously. Uh, the King James has only 11 references to scorpion, three of which are in Revelation chapter 9. Four of the references to scorpions are in the story about the stupid threat that Rehoboam made when he took over the throne of his father Solomon. You want to see a stupid threat? Look at 1 Kings 12, 11, uh, and 14, 2 Chronicles 10, 11, and 14. Once Jesus, in order to drive home a point that we can expect good things from God, used a scorpion in an illustration, that's in uh, Luke eleven twelve. Moses in Deuteronomy 8 urges the Israelites to remain faithful to God. Moses points out that it was God who took care of the Israelites while they traveled through the wilderness. And that care included safety from scorpions in the de desert. And that you can find in Deuteronomy 8.15. Uh, I'm not so sure how helpful those passages are. There are two more. And these probably shed the most light on our current passage, uh, Ezekiel 2.6 and Luke 10.19. In the Ezekiel passage, God is telling Ezekiel to proclaim the pure word of God to a rebellious people. It doesn't matter if they listen or not. Ezekiel is to proclaim God's truth. To strengthen Ezekiel, God says, Son of man, don't be afraid of them or the things they say. Don't be afraid, even though thorns and thistles are around you, and you live among scorpions. Don't let the things they say frighten you. Don't be terrified in their presence, even though they are a rebellious people. 
Now, God may well have been referring to real thorns, thistles, and scorpions. Then again, God may have been using these to represent all the dangerous threats and mistreatments Ezekiel would face. Notice that the thorns, thistles, and scorpions are bracketed with an admonition to not fear the words of God's enemies. Don't worry, God says, I'll protect you from all these thorns and thistles and so forth. The Luke 10 passage is especially interesting. Jesus is speaking to the 72 disciples, or if you prefer 70, who have just returned from their missionary trip. They were delighted because even the demons obeyed them in Jesus' name. Jesus then responds by saying, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Take note, I have given you the authority to step on snakes and scorpions and to trample on all the enemy's powers, and nothing will hurt you. However, do not rejoice over the fact that the spirits obey you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. There are some very suggestive parallels here. Jesus saw Satan fall, and Revelation starts with the fall of Satan, that is, the star. Uh, since Genesis 3, snakes have been associated with Satan. Here, snakes are one of the symbols Jesus uses to depict all the enemy's power. The other symbol for all the enemy's power is scorpion. The power of the scorpion is in its tail, which our current insect possesses. Jesus gives his followers power over Satan's forces so they cannot be hurt by his followers. In our Revelation 9 passage, the insects cannot harm those who have the seal of God on their foreheads. In both the Ezekiel passage and the Luke passage, the proclamation of the pure word of God is a prominent feature. The forces of Satan oppose this. In our Revelation passage, Jesus is spreading, I mean Satan is spreading false religious opinions, blocking out the light of the gospel. It seems like a short step to find in the scorpion tails of our current hideous hell spawn creatures the poison of false te teaching. What misery this has caused over the centuries. Verses 7 through 10. And the locusts looked like horses prepared for battle, and on their heads there seemed to be crowns that looked like gold, and their faces were like human faces, and they had hair like women's hair, and teeth like lion's teeth, and they had breastplates like iron, and the noise of their wings was like the roar of chariots with many horses rushing into battle. And they had tails like scorpion and stingers, and in their tails they had the power to hurt people for five months. There we get that five months repeated again. There is a tremendous diversity of opinions on these particular images, and so uh, I'm going to rush in just like everybody else did. However, uh, one thing should uh, we should always remember is that as we look at these creatures, uh, these creatures, we have to keep the main point in focus. They represent false religious beliefs. So our interpretations of all of these things uh, need to be conditioned by the idea that we are looking for something that represents false religious beliefs in one way or the other. That way we are faithful to the context. We notice that this whole list, and I'm not going to read it again, uh, but it is in a 10-part structure. You can spot that with all the ands in there. That and is, is the uh, um, word chi in Greek. So we have a complete description of all false doctrines, all false religions, uh, so forth and so on, all false philosophies that have existed throughout time. And... Uh, so we just move on there. The images in uh, verse 10 uh, have all been explained. The scorpions, the tail, and so forth and so on, the five months. So uh, we're just going to skip ahead to the things that have not yet been explained. Uh, and teeth like lion's teeth. Actually, that has kind of been explained already way back in Revelation 5.5. 5. We looked up a lot of passages about... Uh, lines and so forth. What we're going to pull out here uh, of this uh, look is a uh, lions are frightening. 
They are to be avoided. B, we are looking at the mouth. And it is false doctrines. False doctrines are what that is preached and that people believe and so forth and so on. Lions are strong. So we don't want to be uh, playing, playing with false doctrine, thinking that they will not be much problem, something like that. I can tell you uh, from a historical point of view, many blunders have been made by the visible church when they thought, oh, this doctrine or that is not going to last. We don't have to worry about it. For example, uh, the Byzantine Empire decided not to attack uh, the uh, uh, Muslims when they were on the Arabian Peninsula, deciding that they would just peter away. You know, that didn't happen, I can tell you. Uh, Islam did not peter away. So, not that I'm recommending war or anything, but I'm just saying to turn your back. The church should have sent missionaries ASAP, and they didn't. Uh, so that's the lion's mouth. Also, you know, lion teeth, they tear, they destroy. Again, the destructive nature of false doctrines is accented. Crowns that look like gold. Now, this is a crown. This is a Stephanos. And we've looked at that uh, before in our notes way back in chapter 2. This is the crown of victory often given to returning generals or given to winners of the Olympics and stuff like that. Uh, so it's a crown of victory. Also, we see that it is made or looks like it's made out of gold. And we looked up uh, all sorts of passages about gold way back in chapter 1 and verse 12. Uh, so uh, the big thing that we should note here, first off, is that they're not wearing crowns of gold. It looks like, they're, in other words, it, it has the appearance of, of gold, but it isn't gold. So they have this uh, appearance of victory uh, with all the power of the world going with them. It looks like they're winning the day, but in reality they're not. It looks precious, but in reality it's not. The Stephanos crown, as I said, was associated with uh, victory. The whole point of, of uh, false doctrine is to deceive people. This crown is a deception. It's a fake crown. False doctrine claims to be the precious truth of God. Looks like gold, but it isn't. False teachers claim victory, but their end is defeat. These crowns of fool gold represents the deceptive nature of false teaching. Breastplate like iron. Uh, this is a brand new image, okay? But uh, it is not the first time the word iron is used in the Bible, nor is it the first time that the word breastplate is used. Uh, iron is used 95 times in the Bible, and uh, any good... Um, Bible Dictionary will probably have a portion of its article in reference to how it is used as metaphors or uh, symbolically. Uh, let me just uh, say uh, that in the uh, handout that's, that's going by, you will see excerpts out of that a lot, along with biblical references and so forth and so on. I'm going to shoot to what we're, we're going to focus on here. And that is that uh, iron is strong, tough, uh, strongest thing since uh, until uh, steel was actually developed. Uh, then we have breastplates, and there's two main types of breastplates that are referred to. The largest one uh, with the most references is the breastplate worn by the high priest. Uh, the other type of breastplate also would be... Uh, for armor, like uh, the Roman breastplate. And even God there is depicted in one place as putting on a breastplate of righteousness. And we are told to put on a breastplate of righteousness by Paul. In another place, he says, let us put on a breastplate of, of light and so forth. Uh, breastplates protected the heart. And uh, that would be, uh, the heart is found 850 times in the Bible. Uh, in modern translations, they don't always translate it as heart because the heart 
was a uh, viewed as what we might call our uh, mind, heart, mind, and soul. So the heart has ideas, the heart has feelings, you can hide things in the heart, and your heart can make plans, on and on and on, all these sorts of things. So a breastplate, if we're thinking especially militarily, uh, is designed to protect the essence of who we are. So uh, rolling these things together then, if you're going to take the religious kind of a thing, then the breastplate made of iron would actually be an inferior thing because uh, for your religious ceremony you want gold, you want good gems, that sort of stuff. And so iron is an inferior thing that would indicate the inferior nature of false doctrine, false uh, religions, uh, false philosophy, so forth and so on. If you're going to take it to be a military uh, breastplate, then you're talking about how hard it is to convert somebody who is bought into a cult or a false philosophy or false belief. Uh, it is Satan uh, rebuffing the Word of God. And the Word of God, of course, is described at times like a sword. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And that is uh, used as we attack uh, the, the, the walls of Satan and tear down his gates. Let's quickly move on now to the horse and chariot. Uh, you might be surprised to know that chariots were used uh, into the 1900s, you know, uh, and uh, quite commonly. Uh, Horses, of course, very big. Both horses and chariots gave uh, people a decided advantage in battle in ancient times. The Hittites, by the way, were the ones who perfected uh, the two-wheeled chariots by, uh, by changing where the wheel, the axle was from the Egyptian chariots. The Egyptians had them. Hittites' chariots were better. At any rate, um, the uh, chariots was limited in its uh, advantage if you got uh, into muddy terrain or into hilly, ter hilly terrain. But in an open field, boy, chariots could just mow down the opposition. It gave you a stable platform to fire your arrows from. You often carried uh, another person who would bear a shield, which would give the riders an extra uh, protection. You would have two to four people on the chariot. Chariots had two to four wheels. You can find all of this stuff out in the handout which I have given you. The idea that some people have that these uh, um, grasshoppers uh, were somehow normal looking is ter certainly uh, put out of place by this sort of thing. What we see here is that false doctrines go on the attack. They uh, don't just simply want to be tolerated. They want to win the day. Um, so uh, uh, also uh, we s might take this to mean that uh, false doctrines, false religions, false philosophies uh, can't win the day on their own. They depend on human resources, military all those passages in the Bible which say that we should not depend on the arm of man or on horses and that sort of stuff, uh, military might, uh, but that's what uh, false religions do. Uh, how often do they want to be enshrined by the governments? Uh, and yet Christianity wins the day simply by the word. Remember, especially when Jesus uh, gave John this vision, Christianity was not the state religion of anywhere yet it was growing and growing well simply by the power of the Word of God. It is the Word of God through which the Holy Spirit works, calling us to faith and keeping us in the true faith. The uh, one final Bible verse adds an interesting light on our text. It is Jeremiah 8, 5 and 6. In this passage from Jeremiah, those who have fallen from belief in the true faith and gone after false religious belief are likened to horses charging into battle. So again, we see this sort of uh, crazed uh, 
hatred of, of uh, those who have the seal of God on their forehead in the ranks of those who have embraced false thoughts, false religions. Um, also, of course, they can't, uh, false religions can't uh, rely on God for protection or their spread, and so they must rely on worldly and demonic agents. Um, but we need to remember always that the horses and chariots of old never really decided victory, just like the, chair, the jets and, and tanks don't really decide victory. It is in the hand of God. The next thing we need to look at is uh, hair like a woman's hair. And there's a lot of uh, wild ideas, but I'm going to have to cut to the chase because I don't want this to run over time. Uh, uh, when we look at uh, this, it's uh, women's hair. Women's hair is their glory. Women's hair is considered uh, beautiful. And uh, they you know, could take great pride in their hair, so forth and so on. Um, uh, so uh, what we may see here trying to get communicated is that the false doctrines uh, look beautiful to people. They are attractive. They make sense. They resonate with our old men, our fallen nature. And so that would be uh, where I would go there. Consequently, that picture, which has probably gone by by now, that shows the hair kind of wild and, and, and flaying out, I would have made that long, beautiful, uh, beautiful locks just because false doctrine, it doesn't reveal itself by showing uh, how ugly it is, uh, how deadly it is. It seduces people. It entices them by its apparent beauty. Human faces, King James, New King James, and uh, New American Standard Version all say uh, the faces of man. Uh, the word used here is anthropos. Yes, you can use the word man, but it's being used in the sense of humanity. It's the generic term, like mankind. So their translations are right, but in our day and age where everybody gets all hot and bothered by the use of, war, of, of the word man in this generic sense, I think the human faces just uh, gets the idea across better. So it is not a gender-specific word. And we can imagine that some of these creatures had a female face, some of them had a male face, uh, just uh, old face, young face. It's just the face of, of humanity, which would accent all of these different people that, that spread the false religions, and it comes from all over the place. The word face appears 450 times in the Bible, uh, and uh, I think uh, I did a handout on that and that it should be flashing by let me check really quick yes i did so you can look up all those passages that are on that uh handout what we're going to do then is just uh kind of jump to the end so and i'm just going to put this together you know uh face of humanity and and so forth and and uh we must remember that uh mankind fell in the in, uh, in Genesis 3. We are now ready to put everything together. The information relating to the human faces that these creatures have. Once again, we start with remembering that these things represent false religious views or systems. One of the primary meanings attached to the word face was that a face reflects who a person is or, in this case, what the creatures are. We therefore have the source of or propagators of false religious ideas sinful humanity. When we are dealing with false doctrines, false religions, and the like, we are certainly dealing with the evil imagination of man. This, of course, doesn't deny that Satan, as the father of lies, is the source and font of all false religions. However, sinful humanity is his willing and eager associate in this demonic activity. You might say we are Satan's prophets, his mouthpieces. Uh, from a human point of view, false beliefs spring from people. Here is the meaning of the human faces of these false beliefs. To wrap up our discussion of these four verses, then, we find in the various parts uh, the description of these locuses of deception, 
wicked and frightening, uh, the wicked and frightening nature of false religious belief systems. Reread it, and you can actually see what false doctrine is uh, from a divine point of view. It is a horror and a plague. Just going to uh, jump ahead. The king, uh, the angel of the bottomless pit, uh, that's Dayton, uh, Satan, uh, the, the star king, you might say. He is called uh, Abaddon and Apollyon. Both of those names basically mean uh, destroyer. Uh, and that is exactly what uh, Satan has been ever since Genesis 3. Uh, the fact that there is a king here indicates that, uh, once again, that these are not normal locusts, as there is no king in locusts. Says normally there's no queen like a queen bee or top dog. Uh, the references that some commentators make about uh, the, the, the Roman god of Apollo are, are lame, and I'm not going to go into that. Verse 12, the first woe is past. Take note uh, that after these things there are two more woes yet to come. What we have here is John telling us this vision is over. Uh, the next vision is coming. It's another terrible one. Uh, and I might point out this is not a time reference in the sense of, well, this covers the first five centuries since Jesus. Now we're going to cover the next five centuries. You know, this, these things are taking place right now. They were taking place in the day of, of John. Uh, and all John is saying is this part of this vision is over. The woe is over. Now we're going to look at our next woe. But don't think of this in terms of time. This wraps up our time together. Uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.